What is up, you sexy YouTube mother lovers? I've got a special treat for you today. This right here, you may recognize, is the iconic Russian machine gun you think of when you think Russia in World War II, the DP-28. Or as you gamers and memers know it, the dinner plate. The uh, dinner plate 28, if you will. You know, this probably needs to be warmed up a little bit. Just like Babushka used to make. <laughs> Just kidding, of course. Communists didn't have food. <laughs> that was fucking cool. That's right, folks. Today we are talking about the DP-28, or in this case, specifically, the DPM, also known as the Dipem. Nobody actually calls it that. I just think it's funny. Much like the AK-47 versus the AKM, which is the stamped variant you see most commonly, something similar with the naming scheme here. Uh, it originally started as the DP-28, whereas this right here is the DPM, which stands for the same, the, the addition of the M stands for the same thing, which means it's modernized. So a DP-27 or a DP-28 would have been the early variant of this gun. Fun fact, uh, it's technically just the DP-27. We all call it the DP-28. That's kind of a Western thing. I have no idea the origin of that, but technically it's just a DP-27. But that of course meaning Degtrev's machine gun in the year 1927, which is when this thing did its military trials. So this thing was about nine years late for World War I, despite having that kind of steampunk sex appeal that a lot of the World War I machine guns had. Now this particular variant, of course, being the DPM, or the Degtarev machine gun modernized. How did they modernize it? Well, the original DP-27 had more of a hunting style stock for one thing, that's the most obvious difference. Whereas this one, the Russians decided that one day there's going to be a place called California, and they wanted to flex on them, so they added a pistol grip. So with that basic intro, let's go ahead and go over some of the basic operations of the gun. But real quick, we just want to thank our sponsor, Kamakoto. Or as I like to call it, Kamakoto. Kamakoto uses traditional Japanese steel to make high quality kitchen knives that are honestly scary sharp. That's fucking ridiculous. These same knives are used by Michelin star chefs all over the world. Now personally, I don't cook a lot. However, I am a guy and knives are cool. Fuck dude. Each knife is individually inspected and comes with a lifetime guarantee. Like this knife is so sharp that it's making me try to remember very quickly where the closest tourniquet is in my house. Not only are the knives cool, but they come in this neat little ash wood box here, pretty heavy duty. So it makes a perfect present for the upcoming holidays. But let me sweeten the deal. But let me sweeten the deal. So Kamakoto is currently running a big Black Friday sale. But because you watch my channel, they're gonna offer you an extra $50 off if you use my code AKG. So that's $50 off on top of the sales that they're already running. So go to kamakoto.com forward slash AKG to get your knife set and to support the channel. They do make a great gift, so I'm gonna leave the links down in the description and in the pinned comment for that. We appreciate them supporting the channel. Back to the video. So one of the more iconic parts of this entire weapon, of course, is the pan magazine on top. So let's take this bad boy out. Our uh, magazine release is right here. We pull this back. And you see this actually goes through the rear sight block and the latch is right there. That's a wonderful noise. All right, so we'll take this out. So we just pull it up from the rear and it's got a little fork up at the front here that when you're inserting the magazine, it goes right into here. So there's this little riveted on piece of stamped sheet metal that accepts that front tab. So if you see this just kind of slides right into there, those two ears go right up under and then it locks into place like so. So we're just gonna take this out and voila, we have our pan magazine. Now this bad boy fires 7.62 by 54R. This magazine has a rotary feed system, which is pretty rad. So when you're loading it, you're just kind of moving this 
back, you see the little follower there actually go down and that's how the rounds actually feed as the gun fires. And this bad boy has quite the capacity. 47 rounds of 762 by 54 r Now let, let's give you some context for what I just said. A lot of you guys probably know this gun from video games or what have you. Obviously, if you watch the Russian Badger, you know why we call this the dinner plate. I'll light his ass up. Go back Man. to Uzbekistan, you piece of shit. You might know him from Siege, from Call of Duty World at War, you know, whatever. But the thing about video games is a lot of times they have a mechanic built in to not make guns overpowered. So even though you have a rifle and a light machine gun that shoot the same cartridge, you know, you can't make your light machine guns as hard hitting as your sniper rifles or, you know, what have you, or else the game just kind of breaks. It's not balanced. So it's important to remember that when we're talking about the DPM, that it is firing the same cartridge as, say, a Mosin PU, a sniper rifle. And for those of you who own a Mosin, you know how hard this round slaps. But when you are firing the DPM, you are firing essentially 47 rounds through this rifle. So just remember that every time you hear this thing fire, that's one guy shooting at you with a Mosin Nagant. Forty-seven times. And if you can't kill it with 47 rounds of 7.62 by 54R, well, I guess there's a reason they made the dish kill later. Now let's go over some more of the features and operations of the gun. One of the more obvious features that your eye kind of gets drawn to, uh, now that we've talked about the pan magazine already, is this barrel shroud here. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty nice little heat shield, except anytime you try to grab it, your hand immediately wants to go into the vents. I've found that out the hard way a couple times today. We also have our bipod here that's built in that really loves to do this and just collapse on itself, so that's really cool. You also have the legs here that uh, are made to be staked into the earth. <laughs> Pretty fucking deep, actually. Because if there's one thing we know, is that all Russian women like to go deep with the DP. And if you're too young for that joke, keep, uh, keep, keep your innocence. So we've got our front sight up here, and then we've got our rear sight back here. Like I said, we talked about this was where the magazine release is. Got a sight that goes all the way up to 1,500 meters, which, I, I mean, theoretically, accuracy by volume, you could probably scare the hell out of somebody at that distance. Up top here, uh, we have where our bolt operates. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, if you have no magazine in it, this up here works as a sliding dust cover. So that covers up the operation of your bolt. If you're in the trenches, whatever, and you don't want your shit to get dirty, uh, you can just slide that dust cover over. Theoretically, that's useful, uh, except when you flip the gun over, the entire gun is open on the underside. So, uh, it's not a perfect system, but hey, it's there. But now, time to get all up in them nerdy guts. So for disassembly, let's go ahead and put this somewhere before I dent it. And also this is the uh, nice little Circle 11 stamp. This one is not a Russian DPM, but instead a Polish made one. So that's where you've got that Polish factory stamp there for Circle 11. That was their Soviet factory designation. So here we're gonna pull this plunger back and rotate this like so, and then this comes out the back side here. So this is our recoil spring assembly. Next, we're gonna take this lever, pull it up, and it actually goes all the way around like a screw. So we're just gonna unthread this, try not to drop it. There we go. This is a super tight, super tight reweld, so there we go. Pull that apart like so, and there you go. There is your fire control which is super simple because this is open bolt. So like said, like we've talked about before on the channel, open bolt, real, real easy when it comes to fire control groups typically. As you see, the entire point of this fire control group is to catch the bolt, since this is open bolt, catch the bolt on this little lip, and when you pull the trigger, just get the fuck out of the bolt's way. And really just kind of stay out of the bolt's way until you want to stop firing, and then it comes back in and catches it. Speaking of the bolt, we're ready to flip this thing over, and you can see this is a long stroke gas piston, and it's actually visible uh, while the gun is operating, which is kind of cool. 
you just gotta be kind of careful um, not to put your fingers anywhere here while the gun is, uh, is firing. That's why it's kind of awkward uh, when you're hip firing it or standing while firing. You gotta make sure your hand stays clear of the moving bits. Pull our bolt out, bolt and carrier. There's your gas piston right here. Here is our bolt. This one is, well, of course, it's a Degterev gun, so he was a big fan of flapper lock. So Degterev uh, was a very, very prolific Russian weapons designer, and just about anything he touched uh, had these locking flaps for lockup. So basically, when this gun goes fully into battery, the bolt will be pushed back like that, and these flaps open up. And basically, what they do is Spider-Man against the side of the walls of the receiver in their little slot here, which locks the bolt in battery while the pressure is still in the chamber. And as soon as the gas goes up through this gas port into this little gas block and pushes against the piston, that actually forces the bolt essentially forward as the bolt carrier is reciprocating and then drags it along for the ride. So you pull this out and the whole thing just kind of falls the fuck apart. But there is your firing pin and here are your locking flaps. Now this is where I have to give a lot of credit to Zach for his incredible job rewelding this receiver because this started out as a parts kit with an original barrel and everything's a really nice kit, but he did a phenomenal job rewelding this gun. You see a little bit of discoloration along where the welds were, but uh, the fact he was able to bring this back to its original glory is actually made more impressive when you realize that the headspace is actually set by the receiver and these locking flaps. So he had to reweld this exactly right, getting down to thousandths of inches right there in uh, where this lockup occurs. When you're talking about welding and you know shrinkage of metal and whatnot, that's not really an easy task. So he really knocked it out of the park on this one. Wow, that's a lot of words. Time for an ADD break. I don't think any of you uh, had any doubt that 7.62 by 54R is going to penetrate a white claw, but you know what? This is my channel. We're gonna fucking do it anyway. All right, taking care of a passion fruit white claw that supported the czar in three, two, one. There's chunks of rocks and shit that I just heard landing in my fucking truck 10 feet away. Uh, probably because we hit a rock that I totally did not see there. As much as I really don't like the uh, passion fruit claw, that smell is amazing when it's aerosolized by a fucking light machine gun round. Come on, they didn't invent the light machine gun to take on one dude. They invented them to suppress and or annihilate multiple. So that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna let the DPM shine. All right, sending these White Claw back to their trenches in three, two, one. Was that a survivor? Nah. I can never be too sure. Okay, there we go. That looks good. Yep. No, nah, I think we uh, I think we managed to get them all. I think we all learned a lot here today. Like, uh, uh, hmm. all right, so now to put this back in, we're gonna line up our piston here and our gas tube. And we've got little grooves here on the side of the bolt that we've got to line up. So we're going through our receiver here and we are back in a battery. And the cool part is if you flip this upside down, and of course it helps if you open the dust cover, you can actually see the flapper lock mechanism working. So when it's fully in battery, you see those flaps deploy and then retract. Now Deg Terev loved this locking flap system so much that uh, he actually used it on quite a lot, pretty much everything that he did that I'm aware of uh, that required lockup. So much so that when it came time for him to build a much heavier duty machine gun, uh, he used almost that exact same system. You might know this machine gun, of course, as the Dishka. As in like this, this Dishka, this is, this is my Dishka. Currently disassembled for repair and maintenance because it's almost a century old design of a firearm. It, it requires that from time to time. But what you'll notice is that it's almost the same exact thing. Just really, really big. Tell me that doesn't look extraordinarily familiar. In fact, 
much like this thing is so fucking huge. Giggity. But you can see the exact same locking flap system on the Dishka that there is on the DP. The pinnacle of Russian ideology. If it ain't broke, fucking use it everywhere you can. Which is why before their answer to everything was, design an AK for it. You need something small and compact? Make short AK. Light machine gun? Make long, thick AK. Capitalist way over there? Make a super long sniper boy AK. So before the Kalashnikov was invented, they just kind of loaded up a cannon full of Degterev and threw it at whatever they wanted to design. But while we were talking about the weight of the Dishka, it brought one more thing to my mind that I wanted to bring up. This whole gun together is actually very heavy. That's why you might have seen I had a little bit of the shaky shakes earlier when I was trying to hold this up loaded. That is because this thing comes in at, what was it, like 27, 25 pounds, something like that, fully loaded. Which means this thing fully loaded weighs about as much as a Barrett M107. Even though it's a light machine gun, it's not that light. Light machine guns, because the heavy machine guns need a truck. Well guys, now that you've seen the DPM in action, what are your thoughts? Let me know down in the comments and let me know what other kind of cool historic machine guns or really any other kind of weapon you guys would like to see. I'm not a miracle worker, but sometimes I can get my hands on some cool shit for my collection. Anyhow, it's a pleasure being able to show off cool pieces of history like this for you guys. Thank you for watching to the end. And as always, I'll see you sexy YouTube mother lovers in the next video. Thanks. <sighs> the shit we do for content, I tell you. And pizza time. <laughs>